the ancient philosopher Iamblichus had one of the best understandings of the nature of demonic spirits, spirits that were eventually portrayed in the grimoires more than a thousand years after his death. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. And today, I want you to grab your bottles and your coffee mugs, for the caravan is ready for us to don our mercurial sandals, to brandish our consecrated Materia Magica, and to all travel back in time together to explore the occult connections between the demonic spirits of the Lamegatons Goetia and Iamblichus, one of the most influential Neoplatonic philosophers of all time. Now, so many authors have done a fantastic job of tracing the chthonic roots of Goetic practice in the ancient world all the way up through our modern time. These are awesome authors like Jake Stratton Kent in Geo Sophia and Aaron Leach in his Secrets of the Magical Grimoires, both of which I hope to do videos on in the future. However, I first came across the specific connection between Iamblichus and his delineation of a specific class of spirits later reflected in the grimoires when I was reading Dr. Stephen Skinner's Techniques of Solomonic Magic book. That's where Dr. Skinner traces the survival and expansion of Solomonic magical techniques like the consecrated circle, the phylactery, and the use of divine names to evoke and control spirits, all the way from the Greco-Egyptians in Alexandria nearly 2,000 years ago up through the Byzantine Empire, and then on to Rome and the Western world. But before we get into the connections and what Iamblichus writes about regarding a specific class of spirits, let's first talk about the end point. That's the Lamegatons Goetia, probably one of, if not the most well-known of the grimoires in the Western world, and it gives the techniques for evoking the 72 spirits that Solomon was said to have sealed away thousands of years ago before the seal was broken and these chthonic entities were released back into the world. So one of the things that struck me about the Lamegatons Goetia when I first read the text years ago is that the spirits do well strange things. Now, this is, of course, moving on from the fact that modern society considers even the discussion, let alone the actual evocation of these spirits, to be a taboo and forbidden subject. For example, though, in the Lamegatons Goetia, many of the spirits are said to lie to the magician unless they're constrained and forced to tell the truth. In addition, they each have an office where they operate within very specific areas of what they can actually do for the magician and even though the magician is a mortal operator of flesh and blood, the spirits are startled and they're stirred up when they're threatened by the operator, and they heed the threats of the magician as if they are real during a successful operation. So, for example, even though I myself managed to amazingly not pass out and run a marathon once last year, and although I consider myself to be in somewhat passable shape, I have actually no physical power to consign the spirits into the deepest hells until the Day of Judgment. And yet, the spirits respond as if that's the case. Also, I don't descend from royalty, but if I wear a paper crown or if I dress in consecrated robes, the spirits respond as if there is immense authority carried by the magician. Now, we'll get into other factors present, such as the occult potency of consecrated items having a role, and also the power of fulfilling the terms between the spirit and the operator, as John R. King described in a podcast episode earlier on. But for now, here's a summary of some of the recorded behavior of these demonic or chthonic entities in the Megatons Goetia. They typically have one office or area that they are under. They obey the magician when given commands. They are said to lie to the magician unless they're forced otherwise, and they respond to verbal threats and materia magica, like a sword, a crown, and giving serious weight to these during the operation. So to me, this always struck me as an interesting menagerie of various displays of the nature of these spirits, but I never saw their behavior reflected in one single source at one specific time from the ancient world in terms of having all of these behavioral patterns in one place. That was until I read Dr. Skinner's thoughts on Iamblichus in Techniques of Solomonic Magic. And in that book, Dr. Skinner mentions that Iamblichus, of course, who lived from 250 to 325 AD, he lived basically at the same time period during much of the writing of the Greco-Egyptian magical papyri. So Dr. Skinner examines Iamblichus's influential work, De Mysteries, which many people think only deals with theurgy and the gods, or at least it gives it a specific focus. 
And this is the part where my mind was blown the first time I read it, where Dr. Skinner comments on and quotes Iamblichus. This is on page 120 and 121 of his Techniques of Solomonic Magic, saying, quote, In De Mysteries, apart from the gods, archons, angels, diamonds, heroes, and pure souls, there is also described a class of unnamed spiritual creatures who are said to be irrational and almost robotic. They are initially described as another class of being from among those which surround us, devoid of reason and judgment, which has been allotted just one power in the apportionment of tasks which has been prescribed for each entity in each of the parts of the universe. Then as there exists a certain class of powers in the cosmos, limited, devoid of judgment, and highly irrational, which are capable of receiving and obeying rational instruction from another, but neither has any understanding of its own, nor distinguishes what is true or false, or what is possible or impossible. It is such a class that is at once stirred up and startled when threats are brandished at them, since it seems to me it is in their own nature to be led by appearances and to be influenced by other things through a foolish and unstable imagination." Unquote. So after I read this, my mind was blown because there it was, more than 1,300 years before the Lamegatons Goetia was first in print in English, Iamblichus succinctly laid out nearly every one of the major broad behavioral characteristics of the Chthonic entities in the Lamegatons Goetia. Now, as I've said, books like Jake Stratton Kent's Geosophia and Aaron Leach's Secrets of the Magical Grimoires are invaluable for putting the goetic and shamanic influences of the grimoires in context and tracing their roots. And so I'm looking forward to doing videos on both of those vital works in the future and continuing to discuss with the authors their great points. And for me, reading this passage in Dr. Skinner, this was the first time I saw the connection between Iamblichus and how he elegantly hit on many of the descriptors of the demons in the Lamegaton Goetia. Dr. Skinner goes through these similarities one by one in his book. So what I'd like to do for this video and for this podcast is take each specific similarity as quoted by Dr. Skinner referencing Iamblichus. And then what I've done is put some of the goetic spirits that highlight or match the attributes as laid out by Iamblichus just to kind of draw the distinctions and the similarities. But this is by no means exhaustive, uh, but it just kind of gives the listener a little bit of a taste for the different characteristics between Iamblichus and in the Lamegatons Goetia. Okay, so first, Dr. Skinner says, quote, they, meaning the spirits, are allocated one function, according to Iamblichus. Skinner says, quote, typically in the grimoires, demons have only one or two specialized functions, so that one who satisfies love must cannot be constrained to help a huntsman or find gold, for example." Unquote. So what I did is then pulled a description of one of the spirits from the Goetia that illustrates this behavior. The description from the Goetia is the third spirit, who is a mighty prince called Vasago, and his office is to declare things past and to come, and to discover all things hidden or lost. So there you have it, one of the spirits in the Goetia, and many, many, many spirit, in fact, every spirit, having a specific office that can serve the magician or the operator after a successful charge is given. Secondly, Dr. Skinner says, the spirits are capable of receiving and obeying rational instruction. Unlike gods or angels, demons are typically ordered around by the magician. To illustrate this from the Lamegatons Goetia, the 40th spirit is called Raum, and he is an earl and appeareth at first in the form of a crow, but afterwards, at the command of the exorcist, he putteth on human shape. His office is to steal treasures out of king's houses and to carry it where he is commanded. So here we have both the office of the spirit, but also carrying out commands, not just being commanded to take on a more pleasant shape in front of the magician, but also to carry wherever the stolen treasures are where the magician commands. So this, I think, illustrates the point. And again, there's over 1300 years of the nature described by by the spirits with Iamblichus, and what we're seeing here in the Lamegatons Goetia in the mid-1600s. The third point in similarity that Dr. Skinner mentions is, quote, 
The spirits have no understanding of truth or falsity. Demons are often accused in the grimoires of lying to the magician, but maybe Iamblichus has a better understanding of the situation when he said they cannot distinguish truth from falsehood. And the example to illustrate this in the Lamegatons of Goetia is the 44th spirit. In order, is named Shax, and he must be commanded into a triangle first, or else he will deceive him, meaning the magician, and tell you many lies. So here we have a really good example, and this is something that I think I noticed in some of the discussions and the forums, Solomonic forums, that this has been a confusing point or a point of discussion about the spirits are lying because they are fallen angels by nature. The spirits basically will tell the magician lies because they want to get out of something because it's, it's an actual intent. However, according to Iamblichus, and as Dr. Skinner elucidates, if the spirits themselves are by nature irrational and basically they can be stirred up and commanded, then what we have here is the spirit just not being able to differentiate or distinguish between truth and falsehood. Okay, so the fourth example of the similarities between Iamblichus writing about a nature of spirits and the Lamegatons Goetia is most telling, he, Iamblichus, says that these spiritual creatures may be, quote, stirred up and startled when threats are brandished at them, unquote. This encapsulates the method used in all of the grimoires, which recommend threatening spirits with punishment in the deepest hell, an action that the magician certainly is not. Not in the position to actually enforce. Such bogus threats are to be found in the PGM where the magician threatens to stop the sun in its course or report the spirit to some supreme god. So here we have another example about how even though the magician literally has no magical powers, unless you're Rufus Opus, you cannot consign spirits to the deepest hell. But yet, the spirits described in Iamblichus and the spirits in the Lamegatons Goetia respond as if that is the case. The fifth example that Dr. Skinner brings up in terms of the similarities is, quote, Iamblichus's conclusion that such entities can be, quote, led by appearances, unquote, also gives justification for the magician wearing regalia, like a paper crown, or other accoutrements with divine names hastily inked on them, a make-believe that would not for an instant fool another human, even a child, and presumably not an angel or god. And so, from the Lamegatons Goetia, one of the spirits that I'm drawing from here that kind of touches on many of these similarities is the 13th spirit. The 13th spirit is called Beleth. The exorcist must hold a hazel stick in his hand, making a triangle without the circle, commanding him into it by the virtue of the bonds and chains of spirits hereafter following, and if he does not come into the triangle by your threats, rehearse the bounds and chains before him, and then the spirit will yield obedience and come into the triangle and do what he is commanded by the exorcist. Because he is a great king, you must do homage to the spirit, as the kings and princes do attend him, and you must also have a silver ring on the middle of your left hand held against your face, as they do for a maimon. So here we have with the 13th spirit, Beleth, hitting on many, many of the similarities with the class of spirits described by Iamblichus, led by appearances, the use of, say, a hazel wand, which in and of itself has many occult attributes, but again, with the silver ring, with the accoutrements, as Dr. Skinner describes, these spirits respond to threats, and they are stirred up in the operation by the magician. Now, the sixth example that Dr. Stephen Skinner uses in Techniques of Solomonic Magic between the similarities of Iamblichus's writings and then more than 1,300 years later found in the Lamegatons Goetia to elucidate the behavior of these spirits is, quote, the standard technique of claiming to be a god or being a dead magician or of acting in the name of a senior demon would likewise not be credited by anyone except an entity who cannot distinguish what is true or false or what is possible or impossible. And so for this example, I've drawn from the Heptameron of Peter de Abano, allegedly by Peter de Abano, and I'm drawing from the Latin here, but the English translation would work just as well, where the magician asserts, in addition to the authority of God and of Solomon, the magician's own authority, himself or herself, 
in the circle and asking the spirit to respect that authority. So, for example, in the ecclesiastical Latin that I'm most familiar with, the magician addresses the spirit. This is about midway through the operation, saying, Ece pentaculum salomonis, quadente vestra maduxi presentiam. You know, behold this pentacle of Solomon, O spirit, that I bring before your presence. But also, Ece personam exorcisatoris, in medio exorcismi. So, again, behold the person of the exorcist in the middle of the exorcism. So here we have another similarity, as Dr. Skinner points out, where in addition to responding to the names of God, the magician also is able to get the spirits to respond to the authority of the magician, him or herself, in the middle of the operation. Again, the spirits are able to be stirred up by threats, but they also respond to authority that is enhanced by the Materia Magica employed during the operation. And again, it's with these six similarities that Dr. Skinner points out with Iamblichus, and then more than 1,300 years later in the English version of the Lamegaton's Goetia, that it just really helped me refocus the way that I conceptualize about the nature of these Chthonic entities. And it's for these reasons that Dr. Skinner says in the book, quote, Iamblichus appears to have understood demons and their manner of interacting with the magician, and he has clearly made the distinction between them and other entities which are dealt with by him under the title of theurgy. His clear statements are probably one of the best analyses of the nature of such demons that we have, and they go a long way towards explaining the theory behind the actual techniques of evocation." Unquote. I definitely agree here with Dr. Skinner, and this again was a definite consciousness expansion for myself personally in terms of how these chthonic or quote other class of beings, as Iamblica says, were understood and categorized based on their attributes thousands of years ago. So to me, reading Iamblichus' thoughts really helps me understand the nature of the Chthonic entities, at least those as documented in the Lamegaton's Goetia, and also to help illustrate what to potentially expect during an evocation, albeit, of course, every operation varies as the art and science of Solomonic technique varies between the grimoire and the operator and all of the myriad of other factors that go into a successful evocation. And I want to be clear here that the focus of this video is on the insights of Iamblichus specifically, and how, as Dr. Skinner documents, this relates to the nature of the spirits in the Lamegaton's Goetia context. Now, this is a very narrow focus, but one that for my own practice really helped confirm attributes within the circle as part of the experimentum. And so I think for operators banishing the armchair for the first time, there is a great deal that one can do to prepare him or herself for this, including any insights on the nature of the spirits themselves, although I do really want to emphasize that the most wisdom, hands down, as many people on the podcast have shared, is gained from direct interactions with the spirits themselves, in the binding, in the questioning, and in the exchange of information and charge that one issues to a spirit. Again, this is in the evocatory Chthonic context. And in a way, what Iamblichus delineates here to me echoes what John R. King discussed on the podcast a few episodes back about how the spirits are led by appearances, yes, but these appearances are part of the fulfillment of terms between the operator and the spirit, and that these terms are vital to the successful carrying out and executing of the operator's charge to the spirit. So, listeners, what do you think? Have you also seen these consistencies between Iamblichus' description of spirits and the Lamegaton's Coatia, if you've experimented with that particular grimoire? Make sure to leave your comments below. As always, I appreciate your great insights and your thoughts, and I hope really that this video, at least in some way, has potentially challenged you to think about what exactly the nature is of these entities that operators deal with, and how Iamblichus' delineations were echoed in the Lamegaton's Goatia and above all, I hope that this might help you in some small way as you gather the courage to step into the circle yourself. Until next time, this is Alexander F. encouraging you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light.